provide the tools. President of the Court of Appeal fires back at the Prime Minister's call for judges to be more accountable. Good evening and welcome to Primetime News on air and online at onespotmedia.com. I'm Archibald Gordon. And I'm Doreen Samuels. Also this evening, change the name. Why the Security Minister wants a state of emergency to be renamed. Dangerous and deadly. A special report on the consequences of criminals using embalming fluid mixed with weed. It wasn't me. Alleged gang leader insists he did not threaten police. Picking up the pieces, TVJ's Herman Green returns to Dominica four months after a devastating hurricane. And in business news, BOJ warns public about using virtual currency. There's also sports first commentary and weather in the primetime package. But before the break, the feedback question. What are your views on renaming the state of emergency now in effect in St. James to enhance security measures in light of concerns about how the country is viewed overseas? Share comments online, facebook.com slash television Jamaica and tweet at television jam. Stay with us. Primetime News returns after this break. Welcome if you're watching on onespotmedia.com. A reminder as well that you can watch TVJ live by downloading our One Spot Media app in the Google Play Store or the App Store. That's the number one, followed by the words spot and media. Up first this evening, the president of the Court of Appeal, Dennis Morrison, has fired back at calls for judges to be more accountable. Quizzed by journalists last week about why he appointed an acting chief justice, Prime Minister Andrew Honus said it's about accountability. But speaking at a function at the Jamaica Pegasus Hotel in New Kingston last night, Mr. Morrison said if governments want to hold judges accountable, they must provide the tools. TVJ's Kelisha Williams reports. Prime Minister Andrew Holness declared Friday that his decision to appoint Justice Brian Sykes in an acting role as Chief Justice is to ensure, among other things, that there is accountability. That statement has not gone down well with the President of the Court of Appeal, Dennis Morrison. He's also taking issue with Mr. Holness's plea for greater efficiency in the justice system. Sir Fred Phillips, a legendary West Indian of whom we should all be proud, put it well, and I quote him, if governments in developing countries require the judges to deliver to the public and wish to hold them accountable for so doing, they must provide the tools. While maintaining that judges should be accountable to the public, he called out the government for not being accountable enough over the years. He paid specific attention to the backlog of court cases, which he said has been given little attention. The Constitution was amended 10 years ago to provide for an additional six judges of the court. This has not yet come to pass. Hopefully, this is the year in which it is promised, and this is the year in which it will happen. He says if judicial officers are to perform at their best, the executive led by the Prime Minister should do its job and provide adequate resources, pointing out that judges and lawyers have very little to work with. All judicial officers are painfully aware of the constraints, both internal and external, which foster delays. Many of them are well known, such as a shortage of judges, an inadequate number of support staff, including judicial clerks, and an inadequate number of suitably equipped courtrooms and accompanying facilities. Kalisha Williams, TVJ News. Meanwhile, the Jamaica Council of Churches, JCC, has added its voice to the debate of the appointment of Brian Sykes to act as Chief Justice. JCC General Secretary Reverend Gary Harriet says the Chief Justice should not be subject to a probationary period. He adds that an individual should not be considered for the post of Chief Justice if there is doubt about the competence to the job. It's a state of emergency, but let's not call it that. The National Security Minister Robert Montague has called for an end to the use of the term to describe the police military operation now underway in St. James. He was addressing stakeholders in the parish yesterday. So what shall we call it? TVJ's Vashon Brown has more in this report. What's in a name? Well, for some people it means everything. And in the case of the state of emergency in St. James, the National Security Minister Robert Montague says it's time for a name change. This amidst growing concerns about the country's image in the overseas tourism market. There is a view that the term state of public emergency could send the wrong signal. And one of the first things we want to make it very clear that after this afternoon, 
We will no longer refer in St. James to the state of emergency. We will refer to it as enhanced security measures. So here's the specific reason for not calling the state of emergency a state of emergency. We are in the tourism capital. Tourism is the lifeblood. And the state of emergency has a negative connotation overseas. And therefore, we would like to refer from henceforth to enhance security measures in St. James. So we have to get the language right so that when we speak of it from henceforth, we speak into the marketplace so we can protect the tourism industry that in turn produce the dollars. The security minister, along with his junior minister, Pernell Charles Jr., toured the communities of Flanker, Norwood and Glendevon in St. James on Sunday. They also visited the Barnett Street and Freeport police stations. The tour, which included officials from the Ministry of National Security, the Jamaica Constabulary Force, as well as the Jamaica Defense Force, was conducted to speak with residents to find out how they're being affected by the state of emergency. In the meantime, Acting Police Commissioner Clifford Blake says the state of emergency in St. James has been effective so far. It has been a good start. It is feeling good personally for me. Each morning I get up and I look at the morning report and I'm seeing St. James nil. It extends my hope. And this is what I want all of us here today to leave with. How can we transform what is actually being achieved now into a long-lasting, I wouldn't say crime but a long-lasting, secure St. James. Vashon Brown, TVJ News. To a topical issue now about a substance causing ganja smokers to go berserk. Embalming fluid mixed with weed. It's said to be used by young men who engage in criminal activities. But experts warn that it's not only dangerous but deadly. TVJ Shimela Mitchell reports on part of a primetime news special. It goes by many different names on the streets, including fry, wet, and whack. The name is arrived at based on how it's done, a ganja spliff laced with embalming fluid. This is the end product of marijuana soaked in embalming fluid. I won't smoke it for obvious reasons, but it is now becoming a popular practice in pockets of the society. A medical doctor whose area of specialty is forensic sciences says it's not a good combination because the embalming fluid has a poisonous chemical known as formaldehyde. Once they light the cigarette, then they, the formaldehyde evaporates very quickly. So as they inhale the smoke, they are inhaling the gaseous formaldehyde. And that is even more potent than the liquid. It crosses the blood-brain barrier. But apart from smoking, some persons would inject it in their bodies or even drink it. The effects of taking this drug is not only dangerous, but can be very deadly. It gets into your liver. Um, it can cause cirrhosis. It gets into your lungs where it can cause fibrosis. I know of at least two funeral homes that members of staff drink it and they started sleeping from then until now. That's more than 10 years. They haven't wake up. They won't wake until judgment morning. But can the substance help persons to engage in criminal activities? Well, formaldehyde is quite volatile. It causes a range of um, effects, including uh, hallucinations. They develop a sense of invincibility, meaning that they feel superior. There is a loss of emotional feeling, so they are not easily affected by emotional circumstances around them. Which is what you're now seeing in this video which has been circulating on social media. A man believed to be on fry getting high. But many have questioned how persons get access to a drug that is obviously should not be on the open market. Checks made by TVJ News reveal that the embalming fluid is not restricted in Jamaica. Therefore, anyone can have access to it. If you are bringing the chemical from abroad, yes, you need a special permit to get it. But if you're buying it locally, no. Meanwhile, Dr. Smith is advising persons who are using this drug to stop. Shamela Mitchell, TVJ News.
This evening, provide the tools. President of the Court of Appeal fires back at the Prime Minister's call for judges to be more accountable. Still ahead, it wasn't me. Alleged gang leader insists he did not threaten police. And in business news, BOJ warns public about using virtual currencies. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Continuing the news. A man named as having issued a threat against members of the Jamaica Constabulary Force says the allegation is fabricated. The police named Mikhail Kushni as one of the leaders of a notorious gang. He's speaking out tonight. TVJ's Kirk Wright picks up that story. Last Friday, after Ron Masters, O.C. Sabadog, was murdered in the Swallowfield community of St. Andrew, the police issued an advisory to its members warning of a threat against the lives of police officers in the Kingston Central and St. Andrew Central divisions. The advisory from the police says Masters was the leader of the Taliban gang and that Nikhil Kushni is second in command. The police advisory says the threat against them came from Kushni, a claim Kushni has denied. I don't know nothing about that. I don't know how they, they come to that assessment. I don't know where that came from, but I have nothing to do with that. Kushni says it's strange the police would name him as the person who issued the threat against them without providing tangible proof. If them say them have a threat where the source is coming from or them need to show the threat or some farm or something, them can't just set, must set out threat so, and I set all police, cause every police get the bulletin on their phone, you know. every police Jamaica wide, you know. all, all police retire and they are foreign get it, everybody. Kushni came to TVJ News this morning because he says the advisory from the police now makes him a target. I feel afraid. I'm afraid for my life because I know I don't do anything like this. Kushner says he's well known to the police because he has been reporting to them on condition of bail for a case that's now before the court. Well, I report to the Fletcher's and police station three times a week, Monday, Wednesday and Friday. My last report date was Friday, so I don't know how come Sunday night they put it out on TV that I'm wanted and man out for me, man out for me. Can't understand that. We asked Kushni about the claim by the police that he's second in command of the Taliban gang. I'm not affiliated with any gang whatsoever. I'm a spray painter, that's my occupation. And my, my workplace is at my home address where if the police come, them, them, them find my workplace I work all the while. So I don't know what is this about. Kushni's attorney, Peter Champagne, says... After his client left court on Monday, he took him to the central police station because of the advisory by the police. Mr. Champagne says he's baffled that the police did not immediately arrest Mr. Kushney after he left court on Monday. Kirk Wright, TVJ News. And TVJ News has just learned that the police have detained Mr. Kushney hours after he was taken in by his attorney to the central police station. A relative of Mr. Kushney says while they were at the station, the police there initially told him he was not wanted. A relative says she later learned that he had been detained. Four months after being ravaged by a Category 5 hurricane, the eastern Caribbean island of Dominica continues its tedious path to recovery. But just how is that recovery process coming along? The TVJ news team of Herman Green and Anthony James were in Dominica after the storm last year and visited the island again for an update. Herman joins us live in studio. Herman, remember the reports on your experience last year. What was it like this time around? Well, I can tell you this, Archie, was a lot less stressful. But after experiencing the immediate after aftermath of Hurricane Maria in Dominica last September, the devastation. We were really anxious to see the progress there so far. But as we did our preparations to return there, we realized that there is also a large number of Dominican expatriates here in Jamaica who are also anxious for updates. For some Dominicans in Jamaica, like Dr. Asha Martin, a trip home six months earlier now feels like years ago. I had been home for the summer for two, week, for two months and I left I had just gotten back up here actually within like a three weeks or so when the whole hurricane thing occurred. She hasn't been able to go home since, but recalls that concerns for family members were only alleviated through TVJ news coverage and the social media. Another set of Dominicans, students at the University of the West Indies Mona campus, share the anxiety. Certain people believe that those who were actually in the country had a more terrible experience. Yes, maybe hands-on, but the emotional distress that we had to go through, being away from home, it was just something that you can't put words to. So, four months later, January 2018, 
we return to Dominica for an update. Like most New Year's, 2018 started with expectations of carnival celebrations here in Dominica. However, this year, those expectations are somewhat tethered by the destruction of Hurricane Maria. Right now, I'm on Bayfront Road, which is the hip strip of the capital. Just four months ago, as you might remember, this stretch was covered in muck and debris. However, today, all of that is cleared up. Traffic is moving, commerce is bustling, and here is pretty much back to normal. Electricity, water supply, and cable, telephone, they are all available. However, we understand that that recovery is limited just to the capital. Outside of the capital, few communities have electricity. Those who can afford it have purchased generators. However, the great demand for supplies, including generators, building materials, motor vehicles, and parts, have some waiting for months. There is also a bottleneck at the ports as the demand and inflow of supplies increase. But there is progress. The water supply for most communities has been restored. Construction and repair work is ongoing, and the greatest progress is seen on the roads as all areas are now accessible. I'm now on the fishing beach in Point Michel. You probably wouldn't recognize it from what we did last year because at that point in September, all of here was covered in debris. If you look over here, you can still see some of the debris which is up to the road level. That is where everything was covered, even the road itself was covered where vehicles couldn't come through. We're, we're going to go to the fishing village now because some of these fishermen are explaining what it took to remove them from that state of disaster to know some semblance of normalcy. Well, the progress, it grew tremendously, tremendously. Because all Dominicans come together to clean up their village. If you point Michelle. Almost a dozen people from the community, including nine of Elvis's relatives, died during the storm. Finding those bodies was part of the cleanup. So it was about two months. So when they go, they just meet the bones. It have a lot of flies. There was smell in the area. So they presume the bodies below the debris there. A lot of flies in the area. People have to evacuate from there. Because you cannot say they have, especially when the sun hot. Last September, one resident on seeing the destruction had said this. I say, Lord, look at Paul Michel. I say, Paul Michel, finish. Yes, I did say that. I said that. What well, then? Now it's clean. As you can see, they made the road. They clean up three, two weeks after. And now Paul Michel is beautiful now. Yes, it's a lot more beautiful than it was before. But while we were there this time around, Prime Minister Roosevelt Skerritt was off the island, so we couldn't speak with him. But we did speak with other government officials who gave us an idea of the economic as assessment and recovery progress for major sectors like tourism, which is the country's greatest earner. I'll have that and other reports for you in days to come. For now, it's back to you, Archie. Thank you very much, Herman Green, there with that report. To news now on the political scene. After being snubbed by party officials, the son of retired member of parliament, Derek Smith, Dwayne Smith, says he's hurt. Smith was hoping to represent the Jamaica Labour Party in the March 5 by-election, but was rejected by the party, which selected Dr. Nigel Clark. TVJ's Giovanni Dennis spoke with Mr. Smith last night following the Era Council 1 meeting. Glowing tributes for the man who served Northwest St. Andrew for seven terms. A man in whom we can say, job well done. Let us say, Derek, you are simple the best. However, Derek Smith, who retired last month, was a no-show. It's unclear why, but days leading up to the Area 1 Council meeting, Mr. Smith had been critical of the JLP's candidate selection process. In a January 23 Gleaner article, he argued that his son, Dwayne, was the right man for the job and that he will not support Dr. Nigel Clark if he's, quote, planted in the seat. But JLP officials countered that the process of selecting a candidate was handled maturely. I am so proud to be a member of the Jamaica Labour Party, a Deputy General Secretary of the Party, where we can solve our problems behind closed doors. Dwayne Smith, in the meantime, maintains that he respects and supports the decision of the party for what he said was the greater good. But... I'm, I'm deeply hurt. It's a constituency that I've spent my entire life. I have shadowed the Member of Parliament over 29 years in his constituency from a little baby to know there's still an argument that I was expecting the constituency to be bequeathed to me and that's not the case. 
Um, I believe I put in the work. I have been here, and as I said earlier, I believe that I wasn't treated fairly. Not treated fairly because he would have preferred a runoff with Dr. Clark. I wish that it went to it went differently. You know what I mean? But the party has made the decision. I am not going to. When you say went to, you mean went to like a selection process? I would have loved it to have gone to a selection process. And just why wasn't there a runoff? It was important to proceed quickly to the by election in order to avoid any kind of um, disrupting the government service, as indicated by the Prime Minister, because the one seat majority will need to go forward quickly. Dr. Chang insists there is no division within the party as a result of the decision. Giovanni Dennis, TVJ News. Meanwhile, despite concerns about him being an outsider, JLP supporters in Northwest St. Andrew have embraced the new caretaker candidate, Dr. Nigel Clark. Party loyalists, fashionists and fashionistas, and well, the unique. From early Sunday, Jamaica Labour Party supporters flocked to the Pembroke Hall Community Centre. Councillors, caretakers, senior party officials all spoke, each seeking to rev up the crowd. But supporters came for two reasons. One, to hear this. Your new member of parliament, Nigel Clark, will be nominated. on Monday the 12th of February 2018 and and the day he will be elected to parliament will be March the 5th 2018 and two to see this a show of unity between son of retired MP Derek Smith, Dwayne Smith, and the party's candidate, Dr. Nigel Clark. I am 100% behind Dr. Nigel Clark. But just who is Dr. Nigel Clark? Rhodes Scholar, a man for all season, man of the people, man for the rich, man for the poor, man of action, Mr. Fix-It, man that gets things done. One of the founding members of G2K. A man whose contribution to the growth and development of this country cannot be questioned. I grew up in this constituency. I was fortunate to go to a good school on Red Hills Road, the best school in Jamaica. St. Richard's Primary School. I bought patties on Red Hills Road as a boy. Dr. Clark will face Keisha Hale of the People's National Party on March 5. For JLP supporters... I'm very confident that we'll retain the seat. We don't deal with losing. Win, win, win. This seat belongs to the Jamaica Labour Party. We couldn't be more confident. Just as all in East St. Mary, with Dr. Don, this is a done deal. Giovanni Dennis, TVJ News. Her views have changed. That's the response from the People's National Party amidst reports that its candidate for Northwest St. Andrew was highly critical of opposition leader Dr. Peter Phillips. Keisha Hale made her position known on social media, where she openly blasted the PNP president. TVJ News tried to get an interview with Ms. Hale, but we were told she was unavailable today. However, the PNP's Deputy General Secretary spoke with TVJ's Andrea Chisholm about the matter. Keisha Hale, the educator who has been given the nod by the PNP to represent the party in the March 12 by-election in Northwest St. Andrew. Before the announcement, screenshots of her Facebook account suggested she didn't find favor with the leadership of the PNP, saying in August, Dear Peter Phillips, just happened to pass Old Hope Road and is only snoring I am hearing. Only a bunting of hope was flying, sir. In another post, she said, Mr. Peter Phillips, if you don't have goods to lead an effective opposition, please step aside and let someone else into the driver's seat. So, when did the PNP know about the comments? Put it this way, it did not affect our deliberations as to whether or not she should be the party standard bearer. Did you see any 
statements since recently with her saying that she made statements before and her her views have now changed no i haven't perhaps you should check her her profile Okay. On, on the same social media page. Well, we did check her Facebook page during and after the interview with Basil Waite, but no post reflecting a change of heart was found. For Mr. Waite, though, it's not unusual for people within the party to support specific individuals. The fact that somebody so astute and competent and transformative as Comrade Hill was able to step forward under Dr. Phillips' leadership to make herself available as a standard bearer. It speaks to her confidence in his leadership. Now, Northwest St. Andrew has been classified as a safe JLP seat. In the last general election, the JLP beat the PNP by over 2,400 votes. You heard the Prime Minister speaking yesterday about the terrible state of the roads. The people in Northwest St. Andrew have been taken for granted. They look at the constituency as a safe JLP constituency, so despite Derek Smith being a member of the cabinet and the JLP in power. No real transformative work has taken place. As for the party's chances at the polls next month... She's going to give it her best shot. It is a difficult constituency to win. We haven't won it since 1976. She is an impressive lady. She has gone to a school that was previously regarded as a failing institution and has transformed the institution and what we want are transformative leaders and to, to attract that kind of talent, mm -hmm. tenacity, commitment and competence to the political process. Andrea Chisholm, TVJ News. In this week's edition of A Ray of Hope, the Brayton Seventh-day Adventist Church in Portmore St. Catherine extends a kind gesture to shut-ins and the needy within the community. A ray of hope is brought to you by Ports Bringing Value Home. Help us, Lord, that as we share and to prepare meals, that it will touch a life and lead someone closer to you. Welcome to the Brayton Seventh-day Adventist Church. My name is Don Blackwood, and I am the community services leader here at Brayton. It is the church's initiative to prepare food for the needy and our short teens, and we do this usually on a Wednesday and on a Saturday. This is going on for over 15 years. We do needs assessment and we realize that the community and even our short team, they are in need like of a hot meal. We serve the community of Reed Spen, Greater Portmore and, and, um, and Brayton. We serve over 100 meals on a Wednesday and like on a Saturday we serve over 150. The church funds it and we have like sponsors. On a Sunday we have an outreach activity where we go and we visit the shuttings, we bathe, we comb here and we have like a prayer session with them. Some of them they are diabetic, find out the level of their blood sugar, we check out their blood pressure and find out if it's normal. As Seventh-day Adventists we practice a healthy lifestyle diet and when you practice a healthy lifestyle you live longer. Whether rain or shine we ensure that they receive their meal. One day we, we um, it was late we had a challenge for the meals to reach them. And as soon as we reached there, I heard one person say, Oh, tell you, they are coming. So that means they have a lot of faith in us and they are relying on the meal. We know them very well. We, we label the food as not to cause any confusion. The community itself, they are excited about what we are doing because even some of their family members, they, they are not able to do what they could do for their family. And because of what we are doing, they are so impressed and they encourage us to continue. It enriched my spiritual life and it's a joy to serve. I do it with all my heart and I love it. I have never feel this way in all my life. We will continue by God's grace to do what we can. We are encouraging persons to come and join with this caring band. Come and lend a helping hand. A Ray of Hope is brought to you by Ports Bringing Value Home. 
Time now for the responses from our friends on Facebook and Twitter. And Archie is at the Smart Board. Thanks, Lorraine. Here's our question this evening. We're asking, what are your views on renaming the state of emergency now in St. James to enhanced security measures in light of concerns about how the country is viewed overseas? Couple of quick comments. Emperor saying, that's all this government plan for to rename everything, but the same approach and same result. Call the general election and call it a different name. Um, Giovanni Heron says, let's all be honest here. The only reason they're um, doing this is so it doesn't look bad from an international point of view because St. James is a tourist area. Makes you wonder whether the safety of the citizens of this country is their actual priority or is it the tourists? Mm. I think we all know the answer. And final comment from Kanil Cole, who says, Would a rose by any other name not smell the same? Quoting from Shakespeare. A, name, a change of name would uh, do little if we don't change the mindset of those uh, who we seek. Keep your comments coming on Facebook and Twitter. Facebook.com slash Television Jamaica. And your tweets to at Television Jam. Business news and news from overseas. After the break.